place. We are doing it now. If you eat at iftari, you've been now for almost uh, 21 hours without food, or 20, 20 hours without food. Iftari you eat, and then another 21 hours, then you eat again. So if you look at it, it's almost one minute, two days. So you've got 21 hours now without food now. Then you're going to eat, or 20 hours without food. You eat, you iftari, and then you can't eat again. Because you're so full. If you're going to eat, it's going to be a tiny little bit. Or am I uh, just uh, thinking that? <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, in, in and out of the fridge. <laughs> so, so that is uh, one meal in two days. It's possible. It's possible, really, it's possible. So you have your, your meal and then again another meal. That is a salihun. So everybody, mashallah, of the salihun. <coughs> then, there's a level, then there's the meal of the mu'minun. The, the meal of the mu'minun is one meal a day. One meal a day. And that's also possible. And that is very good. And when we talk about one meal a day, we say, prepare yourself for a big meal, either lunchtime or in the evening. But throughout the day, have little snacks. Little snacks in between. And then have a big meal. This is the, this is the way the mu'minin eat. Now, but what do we have instead? We have big meal in the morning. Pranta. Very, very thick with ghee. And a little bit of sweet sugar on it. Uh, with uh, a nice uh, desi tea and uh, some of us have a, a latte or some of us have a, a, you know some sort of coffee we go we start our day like that lunch comes we have uh, how many sandwiches two three sandwiches okay and another latte big juice for those who are work those who are not working at home they eat the leftovers of the night before because the night is going to be the big fresh meal something new on the table. So they finish that, and then it's going to be either chawal, it's going to be uh, panini, it's, it's all carbs. And there's always meat in it. Believe it or not, there's always meat in it. And in the evening, again, the same thing. So this is uh, not the hal of the mu'minun. This is not the hal, the state of the mu'minun. One meal a day. Who can do that one? One meal a day, inshallah. al wadifa the al-rabi'a fi al-ta'am wal ilham. Now the Imam Ghazali says, try to minimize your meals. Try to eat one meal a day, and then from there, one meal in two days, and from there, one meal in three days. That is the level of the Siddiqun. And make, understand the concept that the meal is where there's carbs, rice, bread, uh, uh, pasta, barley, couscous. This is a meal, okay? And your little snacks in between is your, your apple, your banana, your, your, you know, these are snacks. And you always snack when you need, have the need to snack. Not continuous snacking. You know, this uh, people snack non-stop. Right? They finish two two-liter Coke bottles in one day. Honestly, two two-liter Coke bottles in one day. There's one guy who told me, I don't eat, for 15 years I've been eating only one meal a day. And he was weighing 26 stone. 26 stone, okay? I'm eating only one meal a day. For, I've, been, I've been doing that for 15 years, he says. I said, can't be. You are 26 stone, how do you get there? With one meal a day. He goes to me, well, I, I, I swear, it's over for 15 years I've been doing it now. So I've been thinking and thinking, and I said, okay, what do you drink? He says, I like Coke. So how many drink of it? He says, well, when I go home, I sit on the couch, and I have two liters, two bottles of two liter Coke. And as I'm watching my, mo my, my TV, I finish them both. I said, that is why you're 26 stone. Just to Coke. The sugars in there can make us really, really big. Allah Akbar. Wa ausatuhu, so Imam Ghazali says, now, that was the third wadifa. Understand the wadaif, the, 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 
the work that he's giving us to do, the halal, then taqlil al ta'am, which is number two, lessening the food intake, and then number three, lessening the amount you take in per day. So one for the mu'minun, one meal a day, one meal for two days, and one meal for three days for the mu'minun, for the, for the siddiqun, which is obviously stretching it a bit very far. And also remember that that depends on the type of work that we, we do. If people are just uh, not doing a lot of work, very simple work, not a lot of physical st uh, strain on their body, or mental strain, even people who do a lot of mental work also, they need a lot of, uh, you know, air, um, uh, fuel to fuel the body and, and the mental state. So it all depends on that. If that is high, then obviously the, the meals will be, will be one meal a day for the mu'minun, and then snacks in between. It's possible that many people will do it. One meal a day. Many people will do it. No. Before Ramadan, since last Ramadan, I've been on one meal a day. Occasionally when I go to the in-laws, it goes a bit off balance. <laughs> but it's, it's possible. It's possible. And now the fourth wadifa, the fourth step is now the type of food that you eat. Not only eat to eat little, but to eat a type of food. Because somebody can eat a lot, but it's very... It's, it's food that is not nutritious at all. And uh, you might have experienced, you eat sometimes something small but very nutritious, you can feel that you can last longer with that than having, uh, you know, a fried piece of chicken from one particular shop with a, with a, with a naan, which is going to fill you up massively. But, you know, you, when it, you don't have the energy, it's not going to last for long. Okay, and when you come to a point like an hour, like hours later, you're going to feel really lethargic and, and, and tired. Uh, so it means that, 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 that food didn't carry the, the vitamins, the minerals and the nutrients that your body needs to, 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 to carry you to, to uh, where you want to be. Okay, so no, imagine subhanAllah Imam Ghazali speaks about these things in the Ihya al -Wudin. It is to keep our bodies in that position, that physical strong position, so we can knock out all of these raka'at for tarawih. You guys, I mean, the, the, when it comes now, especially in this month, uh, time of the year, uh, this, you know, the season, Ramadan is in a very, very d difficult season. So many people, they eat the iftari, have the hima tonight, inshallah, ta'ala, I'm going to try to stand behind that imam. In that mosque, I heard there's going to be a qari, mashallah. Goes to the iftari table, he knocks it all out, and then he's knocked out. And he wakes up, like half an hour before the time the Fajr goes, you know, struggling to wake up, you know, what happened, you know? It's like he was on a hangover or something. He doesn't know what happened. He was completely knocked out. Uh, and that is what we need to be aware of in this time. It is very dangerous because all of this hasanat is going to go. All of this hasanat, I mean, tarawih is such a big hasana, such a big good meritorious deed to do in the month of Ramadan. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Man saama Ramadan imanan wa ihtisaban wa ghufira lahu ma taqadda min dhanbi. Whosoever fasts the month of Ramadan with iman and ihtisab, anticipating the reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his previous sins will be forgiven. And Allah, Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said the same about standing the night in tarawih. Who stands the night in tarawih, imanan wa ihtisaban, with Iman and Ihtisab, anticipating the reward from Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive his previous sins. So look at the, at the compare the Qiyamul Layl and with the Psalm of Ramadan, both the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave them the same reward. No? And they're both, a hadith are both equally strong. No? So let's come back to the fourth word, if you know it, the type of food, wal-idam, uh, wa-a'la al-ta'am, mukhul bur. Uh, the best Imam Ghazali suggests is the, the inner part of the, uh, the, the wheat, meaning that which makes flour. 
So when you grind the flour with its, uh, uh, with its casing, uh, this is the best, you know, whole, whole meat. So the, part, the whole, whole, uh, whole meat, the chapati, uh, seeded loaf, grain, full grain, this type of thing, very, very good. We call that, uh, uh, amongst our, the nutritionists, we call that complex carbs, complex carbohydrates, which is very good because it helps the digestive system. You don't, shred, you don't take away the fibers, the fibers come with it. So basically the natural state is preserved, okay, of the, of the grain. وَأَوْسَطُهُ شَعِيرُ manhul. Sha'ir is barley, crunched barley, this is also very good. It's a bit harder to eat than the, uh, the whole, uh, whole, um, uh, whole wheat uh, bread. It's a bit harder to eat, but it's also edible, it's nice, it's, it's, it's very, very uh, nutritious and, and, and nourishing. وَأَدْنَهَا شَعِيرٌ لَمْ يُنْخَلْ uh, and uh, the, the, the least of it is Sha'ir uh, Bali that has not been grounded. So it's a bit harder and a bit more coarse. Wa a'la al udum. This is the this is called ta'am. Those of you who speak Arabic, who speak Arabic? Ta'am means food. So what Imam Ghazali calls food is bread, barley. And obviously, if you do your analogy properly, rice, couscous, these are all your food. This is ta'am. Now, udum is what you put with your food. So if you've got your rice there, your udum would be your, your salam, your curry. Add that on. It will be your kebab that goes with your rice. It will be the extra bits that you add on. That's your udum. Now, the udum differs from person to person. The rich people will have lots of meat. The people are not so rich, they will only have, for example, here's my piece of bread, and there's a little bowl of khal, a little bit of vinegar. <coughs> and that's all that I have. Wa'ala al udam al laham, and the highest form of udam, of extras that you can put into your. Wal halawa. And with it, a little bit of halawa. Now, a little bit of halawa. Now, sugar wasn't heard of during those the sugar wasn't heard, unheard of the people used to get their, their, their sugar from where from honey the sweetness they used to get from honey and honey was not cheap it's only in uh, the, the 16th century when sugar came into this world big time no they say king henry king 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 henry the third or the fourth he was the only <coughs> one in England that had sugar. And uh, when Columbus traveled to the Americas, that is when sugar really became rife. And that is why the sugar plantations in Colombia and Mexico <coughs> and other places in America became so, so in demand because sugar now became the white gold. And guess what? Sugar is responsible for the slave route from, from Africa to the Americas. <coughs> Sugar is the culprit for so many African brothers and sisters, Muslim brothers and sisters, to have been thrown overboard from these ships that took them in bulk in such harsh conditions to slave where on sugar plantations <coughs> because it became white gold. Now, Europeans, when they see money, they do anything together. Now, so, to think about, to, to think about it, you know, it's good to know, the next time when we have a lot of sugar in our diet, to, to just say, khalas, no. This is a culprit for the slave trade across from Africa to, to the Americas. And what a, what a slave trade it was. It was uh, more torture than anything. وَعَلَىٰ الْأُدْمَ اللَّحَمْ وَالْحَلَاوَةِ So the halawa here we're talking about is, uh, is, um, uh, is honey. honey. وَأَدْنَاهُ الْمِلْحَ وَالْخَلْ And the lowest is salt and vinegar. So if I have a bread, I'll have a little bit of salt, sprinkle it on the bread, 
and have a, a dipper in vinegar and that's it. Or dip it in the vinegar and then in the salt. And we'll eat it like that. Just for a little bit of taste. وَأَوْسُطُ أَوْسَطُهَا الْمُزَوَّرَاتُ بِالْأَدْهَانِ And uh, um, uh, the, uh, the middle or the medium uh, standard is to have a little bit of muzawwarat which is uh, 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 plant-like uh, vegetables and stuff like that with a little bit of duhan, a little bit of ghee fat that goes with it. So Imam Ghazali says all of that is alright. Now a person do have to know that uh, that meat is, is good but too much of a good thing is bad. Okay, meat is a very good source of protein and protein is very important for the body because your skin, your nails, your hair, your, your muscle uh, and so many organs in your body requires protein to survive. And you don't get it from anywhere else except from meat, poultry, from fish. And the only one thing that has complete amino acids is your soya bean. Your soya bean is the only vegetable source that has all the, comp uh, all the uh, 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 amino acids. That is why they call it complete protein. Soya uh, is complete protein. <coughs> Something to consider in place of uh, uh, meat. And you do find some of these, uh, some of these butchers, these uh, you know butchery. Some some of them, what they sometimes do is they mix soya with the kima. Watch out for that one. This is because it's protein as well. So if you go to some uh, butcheries. Uh, I haven't seen anyone of you know, the butchers that I normally go to here in this country do stuff like that. Okay, it's always the meat is always mashallah. But because we uh, we are um, we don't have sausages in our in our diet, I haven't seen much sausages and stuff like that being produced by our local butcheries. But where I come from in South Africa, sausages is an thing. And uh, it's very common in South Africa. And when I fried a sausage one day in my backyard, <laughs> I was frying a sausage and the neighbor said, Astaghfirullah, he's eating haram. <laughs> it's a halal sausage. <laughs> and <laughs> my neighbor was saying, what is this haram food that you have on your, on your grill? I said, it's a halal sausage. I just bought it from the Look, they couldn't get in the mind that the sausage can be halal. But now back home, you can stuff anything in a sausage. You can't see. So some people will put soya in there. But at the end of the day, soya is good, so no complaints. So that is the steps that Imam Ghazali gave us. Five steps. Five steps. So I'll go through them again, and this is just the, we call this riyadha how to discipline our bodies to become used to occasional hunger and to give our bodies limitations and to give it a regime that keep our bodies healthy and strong for ibadah no? number one is the halal food number two is taqlilu ta'am less lessen your food intake and there are many ways as well weight 20 minutes after you've eaten your normal dish wait 20 minutes because the stomach becomes full only after 20 minutes okay but we, we knock everything the the food the dessert and the starter which is already knocked out and your density all in 20 minutes so you have to do starter small and your food 20 minutes wait and then you see if you can go for your dessert if not I'll just leave it, a little taste of it. Now, there's a taqlilu ta'am. Also, sometimes we come with these big plates. <coughs> Have you seen when, some, when you go to people's house sometimes? Mashallah, they want to entertain you. They come with massive plates, the size of a tipsy. You know, are we going to have, mashallah, sunnah? No, 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 say that's for you only. <laughs> So you have to finish, you have to, you have to fill that plate up, otherwise you're going to say, no, 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 no. You have to more eat of that and that and that and that. So your plate looks as so big uh, and you have to finish them all. 
otherwise your host is going to be upset. <coughs> so the, 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 the trick that we do at home is we have smaller plates. Smaller plates and then our meal looks bigger and psychologically you'll feel that you've eaten a big meal. No. So taqlil uh, ta'am. Step number three is try to minimize the meals and have more snacks and not more meals and less snacks. That one is understood. And the number fourth, the fourth step is, the fourth step is to watch what you are eating. Because it's a lot, uh, uh, what we are eating that makes us used to just continuously eating. Because our, 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 our glycemic level is the indication whether we need food or not. Sugar level low, we eat. So if you're going to have something that is well nutritious, your sugar level is going to stay like this, straight. But if you're going to have something very sugary in the morning, it's going to go up. So you feel all energetic, and when it comes down, you're going to feel, you know, you need something. And then you want to eat again, to get it up. And so be aware of that. Uh, swinging the you know glycemic index up and down, up and down, up and down is not a good thing at all. Because your body goes into a fat storing stage. When you swing your glycemic le level up and down, your body goes in a fat storing stage. You start storing fat because your body thinks you are starving now. You need to eat and, 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 and to, to, to prepare it for the next starving you know, period. It stores food rather than burning food. So your body automatically starts storing food. Because it's looking after you. Your body is looking after you. Without you knowing that. Allah created it like that. No? So also, uh, if you eat frequently, but small, nutritious meals frequently, five or six meals a day, this is even better. Because your body stays then, your sugar level stays, stays, stays normal, <coughs> and <coughs> your body then goes into a fat burning stage. Because the body is not panicking. It's not saying, oh my gosh, I need to store all of these things coming, coming in. No, no, no. It's getting used to a frequent dosage of sugar, a frequent dosage of, of, uh, of food coming in. So it's burning constantly. No, so inshallah ta'ala, it's actually four steps, not five. So these four steps, we, uh, we need to uh, get busy with them. I'm talking to myself here first before I speak to anybody else. قَالَ بَعْضٌ بَعْضٌ أُتِيْتُقَى سِمَنْ أَجُرْعِي فَسَأَلْتُ عَنَّا عَنِ الزُّهُدْ أَيْهِ شَيْنْ هُوَ فَقَالَ أَيْهِ شَيْنْ سَمِعْتَ فِيهِ فَعَدَدْتُ أَقْوَالًا فَسَكَتَ فَقُلْتُ وَأَيْهِ شَيْنْ تَقُولُ أَنْتَ فَقَالَ أَعْلَمْ no. Some of the Salihun, they gave some advice. Uh, they said, Qala uh, ba'aduhum, some of them said, Imam Ghazali quotes this particular happening. Ataytu uh, Qasiman. Some of them said, I came to Qasim, al Jur'i, one of the Salihun, our predecessors, Salih, Salih Zahim, an ascetic. فَسَأَلْتُهُ Then I asked him, asked him about zuhud, you know, abstinence in this world. Tell me about zuhud. What is the see? Why? Why is zuhud so important? Or what is it? فَقَالَ What have you heard about it? Uh, and then I told him what I've heard about it, and I kept silent after that. And then فَقُلْتُ And then after I kept silent, said, What do you say about it? Now that I've told you what I heard about it, he said, so he said to me, I'lam anna al-batan dunya al-abad, know that the stomach is the dunya of a slave. فَبِقَدْرِ مَا يَمْلِكُ مِنَ الْبَطَنِ يَمْلِكُ مِنَ الزُّهُدْ So, the more the more he owned, 
of the stomach, the more he owns of zuhud. He owns of the stomach, the less he owns of zuhud. In other words, the more he has control over his stomach, the more he is a zahid. The less he has control over his stomach, the less he is a zahid. It's very good words. وَبِقَدْرِ مَا يَمْلِكُهُ بَطْنُهُ تَمْلِكُهُ الدُّنْيَا And be, uh, depending on the amount that his stomach controls him, this is the amount dunya will control him. وَعَلَى الْجُمْلَ لَا سَبِيلَ إِلَىٰ إِهْمَالِ النَّفْسِ فِي الْمُبَاحَاتِ وَإِتِّبَاعَهَا بِكُلِّ حَالٍ وَبِقَدْرِ مُجَاهِلَةِ النَّفْسِ يَكُونُ الْأَكْتِبَاعَةِ تمتع في دار الآخرة قال أبو سليمان الداراني ترك شهوة من الشهوات أنفع للقلب من صيام السنة وقيامها وقيامها. so Imam Ghazali says we in general he says there shouldn't be any negligence don't neglect yourself when it comes to the mubahat. The mubah, the things that is mubah for us to do. That is, that uh, you are allowed to have of the mubah, the things that is allowed for us, but you have to have a certain amount of control over that. Abu Sulaiman al Darani says, to leave a shahwa of the shahwat, our shahwatul batan, shahwatul faraj. Is better than ibadah to sana. It is better than engaging or sorry, siyam sanati wa qiyamuha. It's better than fasting the entire year and standing the entire year in tahajjud. To read, to do, to leave and get rid of one shahwa of our shahwat. No. And that is obviously beneficial in the long run, long term, because when a person disciplines the nafs. It is those shahawat that stand in our in our in our path of disciplining ourselves, becoming better people. No? It is the nafs that desires food, that desires the opposite sex, that desires revenge, that desires desires status, that desires wealth, that desires X, Y, and Z. And all of these desirous things are all coming from the nafs. So if you can knock down and control one after the other, the better for us. <coughs> so we don't are not controlled by our nafsani desires, but rather our aql controls our desires and said that is not, that is enough now. And then you can stop. And you won't feel that you are uncomfortable in this dunya. No? So inshallah ta'ala, this is, shall we open the floor for questions inshallah. And inshallah, there's one particular topic that I would have loved to, to, to bring in now, but it uh, seems a bit big. Uh, <coughs> now I'll bring it in basically. Uh, this particular point is Ikhtilaf, Hukmu, Al Jawa, Ahwaliya. Uh, the ulama, they had differences of opinion on this particular thing that we have just spoken about, which is to control the intake of food, to, 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 to stay hungry for a certain period, uh, a couple of days during the week maybe, no? maybe on a Monday, maybe on a Thursday. We all spoke about the 5-2 diet that everybody is speaking about, which our beloved Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam spoke about 1500 years ago, the 5-2 diet. And as a matter of fact, they say, well, uh, we recommend that you uh, that you give your metabolism a break on a Monday and uh, on a Thursday. And they think they've discovered something. This is what they've done now, recently, recent discovery. So Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught us that <coughs> not to be too extreme, extreme. You know, don't do ruhbaniya. Don't do that what the ruhban does. Which is the ruhban? The monk. The monks used to do this. And uh, there were three men that came to the house of Sayyidina Aisha who said, Inni la atazawwaj. The one said, I don't get married. And the other one said, Inni la uftir. I never eat. 
you know, I mean, la uftir, yani, I, I fast the entire dahar, the entire year. And the other one says, wa, wa inni la anam, I don't sleep. I stand the whole night in tahajjud and pray, 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 all day, all night. So Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came home and said that Aisha informed them about what these three men have said. And Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Amma ana, as far as I'm concerned, fa'atqaakum ila Allahi wa akhshaakum lah. I am the most God-fearing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, most revering to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, mighty and majestic being He, capital H. But, inni asumu wa aftir. I fast and I eat. Wa wa usalli wa arqu. I pray and I sleep. Wa atazawwaju nisa and I marry the woman. Faman raghiba an sunnati, and whoever deviates from my sunnah, falaysa minni. It's not of mine. Okay, so this particular principle here is what the Sufi, what, what uh, um, Imam Ghazali, in all fairness, Imam Ghazali, he was the type of people that went for the, knock the nafs out with a uppercut, and then you're done with him, or with her. Allah's done, give it any break. Knock it, I'll give it a knockout punch. Some of the uh, awliya, like uh, Imam uh, Abu Hassan al-Shazili, they were like this. Don't knock the nafs out, because if you knock the nafs and you, and, and, and you don't knock it out, it's going to knock you back very hard. So what you do is, you give it what it wants in the shari'i parameter, the shari'i limits. <coughs> Say, I'm marry, marry for wise. Anything more? No, halas. If you only eat meals, eat. But in the limits of the Sharia allows you, house. Then you give shukr to Allah. Now we're going to see if you're the time. You're going to give shukr, thankfulness. You're going to show gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is what our beloved Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was on. And all of the anbiya, they were not zuha to the level where they starve themselves for days on end. They don't drink water for days on end live in a cave. No, they mixed with people. They were people's men. <coughs> they married women. They had children. Okay? They reared families and communities. And they lived a normal life. They ate, they drink, they sleep. Sometimes Sayyidina Aisha said, we sometimes have so say Sayyidina Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam eat. And we said, Ya akulu wa la yasu. Sometimes he used to eat, 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 and we thought he never fast. And sometimes he used to fast and fast and fast before he never eats. So look at that balance. Okay? So this is what Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa left behind him. This is the way, this is also a way to, to create, um, you know, to reach a certain rank by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is also our, our, our ultimate goal, is to gain that rank, that uh, closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Imam Ghazali says, Qala, yani, aqsa, the best, the thing that is matlub, that is required from a mu'min is to be wasat, to be in the middle. Like Allah says in the Quran, in, uh, in Surah Al-Baqarah, وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَاكُمْ أُمَّةً وَسَطًا لِتَكُونُ شُهَدَاء عَلَى النَّاسِ And we've made you a people who are, uh, follow the middle path. فَخَيْرُ الْأُمُورِ أَوْسَطُهَا the best of paths are the middle path. وَإِلَيْهِ أَيْ إِشَارَةُ وَكُلُوا وَاشْرَبُوا وَلَا تُسْرِفُوا When Allah subhanahu wa says in the Quran, كُلُوا eat, وَاشْرَبُوا and drink. However, لا تُسْرِفُوا Don't waste. Okay, don't waste. وَمَهْمَ لَمْ يَحِسُوا الْإِنسَانُ بِجُوعُ وَلَا شِبَ تَيَسْرَتْ لَهُ عَلِبَادًا وَالْفِقْرُ now, this is a very, very important point Imam Ghazali says, uh, makes here. He says, So, as long as a person don't feel hunger and he doesn't feel satiation, Ibadah will be easy for him uh, to ponder and to make tafakkur will be easy for him and he will have strength to do work. However, this method only suits those people 
who have conquered the nafs from all of their bad habits of eating. So when does this apply? This applies when the when the nafs is already now being uh, weaned off from all of the bad habits of eating whenever you want to and just uh, dining and dining and dining, right? Once the nafs has already reached that level. So these are only uh, that had like Imam Abu Hassan al Shazri, uh, uh, Abu Abbas al Musi, you know, uh, great men of Allah subhanahu wa taala. What they used to do is they used to sleep in a soft bed. Not on a hard floor. Say so because when I sleep on a soft bed, my body can give better sugar to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the nice sleep that I had. When I do sugar to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the ni'mah of sleep, I feel like I want to. And when I drink a cold glass of water on a warm day, I thank Allah subhanahu more sincerely and more, you know, you know with, with intensity, than if I had to drink a warm glass of water. And when I wear these nice, nice clothes, I thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more because He used to wear nice clothes, isn't it? Abu Hassan al Shazi. You know, cast of clothes, old, worn, worn out clothes. He used to be representable. And so all of his followers afterwards. And that was the way of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa Never looked like he, as Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa always looked presentable and smelled nice and had a wholesome face, okay? There were times of hunger, but Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam ate to keep himself upright and to face his community, to be in jihad, okay? But that is, when you do this and eat like this, it is after you have taught your body and your nafs, this is the way. And not when you're already, you know, uh, you like your... your, your, your three donuts and after three donuts you make three eclairs and I like that and I like that and eat I'm still in that mood this is not the time when you think of this particular uh, method to follow the method you need to follow at that particular time is the method of cutting down till you reach the level where you have um, stability in your, in your diet so the wasat way the middle path is the path of the mu'minun it's something we need to be aware of. It's something we need to practice in our... Now, there are many qissas Imam Ghazali uh, mentioned about how the awliya used to eat. They used to eat, some of them used to eat excessively. Like, for example, Imam al-Shafi'i. Imam, Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal invited Imam al-Shafi'i and said, Come to my house. You know, you're not ma uh, he was married, but you can have another. So, I've got a daughter, you can have my daughter. I really, really would like you to have my daughter. Imam, Imam uh, Ahmad and Imam al-Shafi'i, they used to be like this. So he comes to the house and he tells his daughter, I'm bringing over Imam al-Shafi'i that I've spoken about so much. So you watch him, okay? If you like him, then he's yours. So uh, she starts watching Imam al-Shafi'i, okay? And she's behind a sutra, but she's watching his, uh, his requests. So Imam al-Shafi'i, when he came to Imam Ahmad bin Hamad, he never used to eat a lot. But when he came to Imam Ahmad, he ate everything on the table. <laughs> And Imam Ahmad's daughter was like, um, is this the guy you want me to get married to? Well, I, the, will this mean that I will have to cook every single day all of these food that I'm cooking now? Khalas. Let's see how he is with his ibadah. And uh, the night, uh, Imam al-Shafi never stood up for tahajjud and for ibadah. And he was just laying in his bed all night through. Fajr comes, Adhan goes, he stood up to go go. And says, no, 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 no. This is not the type of guy that my father would agree with. He <laughs> doesn't even stand up for the hajjud, you know. Why bother? Forget about it. But Imam al-Shafi ate like that because he haven't ate for three days. When Imam Ahmad asked him, now why did he eat so much? I haven't ate for three days. When I came to you, I ate to make up for those three days I haven't eaten. And no tahajjud, what's this? He said, I ha didn't have tahajjud because there's, I went through the Qur'an three times while I was asleep, while, while I was in my, in my bed. Three times I went through the Qur'an. There was a mas'ala that we spoke about earlier and it was bothering me and I was thinking about where the answer is to this mas'ala. And I went through the Qur'an three times and I got the answer. He says, that's better than tahajjud by far.
But his daughter said, tell us, no, 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 no. She's so different. So you get the, this particular attitude of the awliya where they eat, but then they are already in the system, okay, of controlling their, 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 their self. And there are many cases like that, and inshallah, I think this is a, a good place to stop, inshallah, and if anybody's got questions on the method of Mama Ghazali, uh, and the method of the awliya, the method of the salihun, the siddiqun, inshallah, we'll try to, to answer the questions, inshallah, alhamdulillah, <coughs> rabbi I would say uh, it's, it's, it's very difficult nowadays because you know, the type of foods that we are normally used to, we have to change our lifestyle basically. Where we buy and what we buy. Because the, the, the processed food is not that nutritious, it doesn't last long. It doesn't lie. The nutrition in the processed food are very minimal. So you need to have nutritious meals that can last you for longer hours. And that is, uh, that's a fact. So if we have, uh, you know, some uh, basic pasta, basic rice, uh, uh, not uh, complex carbs in our diet, we are going to be very quickly hungry after meal. Okay. So the way to do it is, uh, apart from training the stomach to shrink because the stomach has to shrink, and this is my, my problem, <laughs> to shrink the stomach. Shrinking it is a, is a process you have to go through to get to that level. Once it's shrunk, then and you feel you can't get it in anymore, then you have to stop. No? Uh, and there's only one way to do that, to gradually <coughs> decrease your food, gradually decrease it. But uh, um, uh, a person can decrease the food, but if it's not nutritious, then you're going to ask for food later on. So your diet is, you're going to start a diet in one week and then go back onto your normal routine the next week. And that is not what you want. You need to find the, the right food, find the right diet. And sometimes you need to also supplement your diet. Nowadays you have to supplement your diet. The chicken that we have, that 90% of us have is chicken that has it's processed chicken injected with all sorts of hormones and the type of food that they are being fed is fish meal which is an unconventional type of food for for a chicken and then you have also the our our red meat our our our, our cattle are fed a certain type of meal that is also unconventional which is corn corn you know, when have you heard of a, uh, a sheep or cow or bull eat corn? Corn is not there, it's they, they eat grass. Now what corn does, corn causes acid in the stomach of the, of, of the, of the, of the animal. And then the animal normally has, uh, you know, the, the cow is a unique digestive system. Right? It's got two stomachs, if, you, if, you, if you've heard about this, it's got two stomachs. Now when the acid grows in the stomach, uh, it does not uh, it help the cow to do its normal digestive, uh, you know, the digestive system of the cow does not work normally as such. Half of the food is not properly, you know, digested and the cow grows big but with very bad digestion and that goes into the, into the meat uh, and that 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 meat is not good meat because there is certain uh, you know toxins in the meat if you like that ends up in our stomachs when that cow is slaughtered. But it's a very uh, good way to 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 do. It's a very good growing meal for, for, for cattle, growing meal. But it's not a good digestive meal for for for, for cattle. So. Uh, People suggest uh, organic, organic is expensive. Uh, my suggestion is less meat, more plant. And there's a study that has been done over a period of 50 years. This recently came in the Daily Mail. They've done a study of 50 years. This is a historical study. For people to have longevity and actually grow younger, 
not grow older, grow younger. As they grow older in age, but actually look younger, is the following. They have to have more plant in their diet, uh, meaning less meat. They have to do a little bit more exercise, and they will have to do relaxing exercise. Okay, now if you look at your chromosome, they say this is what happens. The chromosome, if you, if you all have done GCSEs in school, <laughs> chromosome, you've studied the chromosome. It, look like, it looks like an H, two ears on top and two legs at the bottom, and a joint in the middle. Now these long tentacles on top and, and at the bottom, if they start fraying, um, the best example that they gave was a shoelace. You see the little plastic tip on the sho shoelace. Right? If that is still hard and intact, it means the chromosome is healthy. It means you're going to look healthy and you're going to look young. Because the chromosome is a young chromosome. Now, when the chromosome goes old, which means we're going to look old and, and, and you know, we've be, uh, been going through a couple of years, it means that that, like a shoe is when it starts fraying, and the plastic comes off. It starts fraying. This is what happens to the chromosome, the edges of the chromosome. When it starts fraying, that is a sign that we are getting old. Now, when we eat more plant and do exercise and do relaxing exercise, we to eat like yoga and we don't have a problem, we have salah. Okay? This is our relaxing exercise. So we don't call it exercise, we call it ibadah. But there's movement, but relaxation with Allah in there. So when we do that, or when a person does that, that plastic part on the shoelace becomes stronger and longer and it covers more of the tip of the chromosome if you follow that diet. They've done a 50 year study on this. So people who who look 60 will look 40. People who look eight, who's 80 will look 60. <coughs> and that is the reality of it. No? So people can reverse the clock. No? But normally we just uh, heard about this little tablet that's going around nowadays. Have you heard of the little tablet? The youth tablet? It's going around, people are all buying it now. But it's not working because uh, what's the point? You're taking a youth tablet and you're still carrying on with your diet. Meet in the morning, meet in the afternoon, meet in the evening. Hmm? So this is the best recipe to, to, to meet death earlier. So uh, that is a uh, good advice and uh, this is also why the muhaddithun used to live up to 80, 90, 100, 120 years old, the muhaddithun. Why? Because they used to travel a lot, meaning they used to be constantly in action, coming from the sheikh, meeting the sheikh in Bukhara, meeting the sheikh in Khorasan, then traveling from there, going to Iraq, meeting the sheikh, going to Egypt, meeting, meeting, going to Sham, meeting the sheikh, they're constantly moving. And they had little to eat, and what they ate was the easy and the cheapest was plant. And this is why they live so long. Many of the, the Muhaddithun, look at their biographies, they're all above 80 years old. All above 80. And that's obviously with the barakah of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's dua as well. Whoever involves himself in the study of hadith, Allah will extend and lengthen their life. Now, so. Uh, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, we, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to keep us always, you know, include up with our, uh, our, our health aspect and, and what we put in our stomach. Because Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was really, really, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, include up, apart from being the Nabi and everything that he had, or that he said and that he knew was all divinely inspired. He passed on this knowledge so, he, so we can benefit from these uh, divine knowledge that, that he had alayhi salatu was salam uh, and to put that to practice is, is a plus for us in our lives, it's a plus for us uh, in, in our ibadah, it's a plus for us in you know, our, our well-being. Now, Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam loved 
to tell the Sahaba, if you want to ask for something, ask for well-being. Ask for well-being. Abbas came to Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam radiallahu ta'ala an. Sayyidina Abbas, uncle of Rasulullah. He said, Ya Rasulullah, what shall I ask for? Ask for afia. He goes, he comes back. What shall I ask for? Ask for afia. He goes, he comes back. What shall I ask for? Ask for afia. Because once you have afia, once you have well-being, you can do a lot easily with happiness, with concentration, with uh, enthusiasm, uh, you know, you be enthusiastic with, uh, with, with this deen, with this ibadah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inspire you with your, with your attitude towards, towards the deen. Inspires you, give you tawfiq. And this is what we need to be, inshallah. People who are inspired, hyped up, checked up for this deen, inshallah ta'ala. Alhamdulillah, Ya Rabbi Alameen Al-Fatiha. والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المسلمين سيدنا ونبينا ومولانا محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم يا ربنا لك الحمد كما ينبغي لجلال وجهك ولعظيم سلطانك سبحانك لا نحصيتنا أنا عليك أنت كما أثيت على نفسك اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم اللهم اغفر لنا ذنوبنا ونوب والدينا ومشايخنا ولجميع المسلمين أجمعين ربنا يسر ولا تعسر ربنا تمر بخير وأنت يا الله الكريم يسر الله وفعنا وعلمتنا وعلمنا ما ينفعنا الحمد لله على كل حال ونعوذ بالله من حناه ضلال ورحمة لك يا رحم الرحمين والحمد لله رب